of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everyone. Under provisions of the Public Meetings Law of the State of Missouri, the board must adopt by roll call vote an agenda that includes the time, date, place, and tentative agenda for the meeting. A copy of the notice and agenda for this meeting was posted on Monday, June 13, 2017, at the Administration Center, 1005 Waterford Drive, Florissant, Missouri. At the same time, copies of the notice and agenda were mailed to major radio and television stations to three newspapers to all municipalities, schools in the district, and posted on the district website. Motion. I, I Motion. Second. It's been motioned by Leslie Halstead and second by Donna to adopt the agenda. Call for the vote. Ms. Favor. Aye. And uh, Ms. Hogshead. Aye. Ms. Hart. Aye. Secretary votes aye. Dr. Graves. Aye. Uh, motion carries. Uh, um, Ms. Ponder and Shavolt, I'm sorry. Shavolt um, will not be with us this evening due to prior engagements. <laughs> this portion of the meeting is allocated to show a short video from the Missouri School Board Association to provide a report of current activities and events that may be of interest to the board members and the community. everyone and welcome to the Missouri School Boards Association's board report for the month of June. We thank you for the opportunity to share some news and information during a few minutes of your board meeting. We begin with a look at potential cuts to the Medicaid program and the impact those cuts might have on our schools. The U.S. House of Representatives has passed and sent to the Senate a health care bill that will result in significant cuts to public schools. The bill would change the way public schools receive Medicaid funds necessary to provide services to students with disabilities. Public schools throughout the nation receive about $4 billion a year in Medicaid funding. Schools in Missouri receive about $20 million a year from what's called school district administrative claiming under Medicaid. MSBA Associate Executive Director for Student Services, Dr. Kim Ratcliffe, says cutting Medicaid funds would undermine the ability of public schools to meet the educational needs of students with disabilities. She says most people, including lawmakers, don't realize the extent of medical services being provided to students at school. We provide one-on-one -on -one nurses, personal care attendants, we catheterize, we tube feed, we suction. Uh, we have children who have come on total life support to school. And so, in order for us to be able to educate those children, these services need to be in place. And the provision that we've been given in the past has been that Medicaid dollars can be used to cover the medical cost of otherwise eligible children. And that's being threatened. If we lose that money, every public school within the state is going to feel the impact. Radcliffe oversees MSBA's Medicaid Consortium a program that helps schools get the reimbursement to which they are entitled for providing services to students with disabilities. President Trump's proposed federal budget also calls for major cuts to Medicaid that would have an impact on local school district budgets. MSBA is sponsoring a visit to Washington, D.C. soon. It's an opportunity for board members to meet with members of our congressional delegation to discuss federal education issues that are important to public schools, including the Medicaid issue. That trip is scheduled for June 27th through 29th. Check the MSBA website for details if you're interested in making that trip to Washington, D.C. 
The 2017 regular session of the Missouri General Assembly has adjourned. The session was notable for issues that did not pass as much as for bills that did pass. Among those bills that did not pass was Senate Bill 313, the tax credit voucher bill that contained numerous other provisions, including accreditation by school building rather than by school district. MSBA strongly opposed the bill since it would have provided taxpayer money to private schools that are not accountable to the public. MSBA Associate Executive Director for Advocacy, Mike Reed, says board members who contacted their legislators on the issue made a difference. Membership getting in and saying that this is not good for, for our local districts. It was not good for the kids in the state of Missouri. Um, this is a, uh, again, it's a voucher bill without any uh, overlooking and overseeing exactly to make sure that, that the money is spent wisely. Uh, but that being said, uh, we will see those bills again, uh, perhaps shortly. Another bill opposed by MSBA that did not pass would have expanded charter schools in the state. Legislators did approve a $48 million increase in the foundation formula funding, meaning the formula is fully funded under current law. While that's good news, Reed says, school districts may not necessarily receive the full amount of state funding in the coming fiscal year due to the state's uncertain revenue picture. <coughs> Registration for the 2017 MSBA Annual Conference in cooperation with the Missouri Association of School Administrators opens this month. This year's event is scheduled for October 5th through the 8th at the Lake of the Ozarks. We'll have another outstanding lineup of keynote speakers this year, including award-winning journalist Stone Phillips, who happens to be a Missouri Public School graduate, and Michelle Gay, the co-founder and executive director of Safe and Sound, a Sandy Hook initiative. The event also features more than 100 breakout sessions, all designed to improve the leadership skills of school board members and administrators. You can register for the annual conference on the MSBA website. That's it for this month's edition of the MSBA Board Report. Thanks for allowing us to have some time at your board meeting and so long from Columbia. This portion of the board meeting is allocated for the board to provide an update of current activities and events in the district that may be of special interest to board members and the community. Mr. Eben? Thank you. Ms. Hossett? Yes, I'd like to give an update on my strategic plan. I have been uh, graciously moved and I hope that I don't drive people crazy on my new uh, adventure, but I'm excited. I'm on the technology and facilities portion of the strategic plan. Oh, what? Yes. I can throw my engineering hat. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, as far as technology is concerned, they are working on the McCord North Annex, moving technology um, to that building, and they have purchased uh, new flat, green smart board for um, the uh, STEAM school, which we're all excited about. And, there, and um, uh, that will be, plus they're going to in-service on the smart panels, in-service on Chromebooks and laptops. We have a total of 25 <coughs> smart panels for the new building, and they should be here mid to late July, ready for school to start. Um, they will be moving the uh, technology into the annex in July and August, and the STEAM kickoff is August 4th, and then uh, our back to school will be August 5th. I want a party that we're having here. I also want to talk a little bit about facilities. There's a bid tonight to uh, approve the uh, <coughs> filter, HVAC filters and that will be for 26,000. We get 7,000 air conditioner filters a year. That's a lot of AC filters to change. Um, we have a new roof at our new STEAM school, our new building, and it has a, part of it has a 30 year guarantee and another part has a pin that's gonna outlast us all, right Terry? And uh, we saved about $600,000 on this project. So it was supposed to be at 1.2 million and it came in about a little over 600,000. So that's, that's great. Um, 
the STEAM Academy is moving at a good pace and uh, all of the uh, construction is underway. Uh, classroom furniture and, uh, has been ordered and it's adaptable and can be easily <coughs> moved around for collaboration <coughs> and uh, for the learning environment. So that's exciting of how they're going to move, move their desks around and work together. Um, in other projects, we have the district-wide cleaning that the plant does every year. We are mulching playgrounds. Um, we are doing the construction at Duchesne to add the probe uh, uh, center there. We're also doing uh, quite a bit of summer painting. And at <coughs> floor, they're getting a new uh, freshman academy and they're remodeling and painting uh, M5 so that it can look fresh and new when the students come in for their new academy. So it sounds like Terry and every and technology <coughs> is moving forward and doing a great job. So I just want to thank you. Mrs. Hart. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My area of the strategic, strategic plan is networking, which was formerly known as a stakeholder and community engagement. May 31st through June 6th, district leaders spent five days in the Summer Institute for Excellence in School Leadership. Over 130 staff representing all of our schools, central administration, represented the district at Washington University, the University of Missouri St. Louis, and spent one day in our communities discussing a variety of school and community topics with various stakeholders. This deep dive day was a great experience for staff and community members alike. Once again this year, the district is offering meals and reading opportunities at various locations across the district. Be sure to check the website for details. On Sunday, July 16th, from 10 to 2 at McClure High School, Carolina Crowns, Samaritan's Feet, and the FSSD will collaborate to serve 1,000 students in the district footprint with shoes and socks. In addition to new shoes, Molina Healthcare is making a contribution towards the district literacy initiative with a donation to purchase books and school supplies. We call it a day to serve students from head to toe. Community mentors from the FACE department continue with their mentoring goals by supporting the Florissant uh, Police Department and the DARE camp. Students from the district and neighboring districts attended field trips to the zoo, Rance Farm, the St. Louis Science Center, and the JFK Swimming Pool. The base department is creating a data wall for PBIS to assist with implementing a baseline for discipline district-wide that aligns with the goals of the superintendent. This district is excited about welcoming the community to ribbon cutting at the new STEAM Academy on Friday, August 4th at 1030. Look for more details soon. Save the Date initiative have gone out for the, about the Back to School Fair on Saturday, August 5th from 9 to 12 30. You can start signing up to be in the Duncan booth immediately. Also, <laughs> also I'm on the uh, Youth Advisory Committee for the Florissant, and uh, there's an event coming up called Suicide Prevention Awareness Fundraiser. It's Saturday, September 16th. The one I have to tell you that suicide is very high among teenagers, and there will be a 5K uh, race, one mile run, a fun run. And it starts at 6.30. The fee is $25 to August 25th, $30 August 26th through the race day. Also, there'll be a softball tournament, <coughs> and that's for 18 and over. The fee is uh, $25 per team. There'll also be a barbecue and raffle. And also, I want to let you know that all proceeds go 100% to the suicide uh, prevention. And if you're interested in being also, we're looking for vendors <coughs> as well. So if you're interested for donation, vendors or whatever you know whatever you want to do or participate and there'll be more information soon you can contact myself or you can contact Beth Carr and I have a phone number and website thank you for your support Dr. Thurman good evening everyone I don't have a lot um, I just wanted to uh, give you a little information about the adoption of the new code of conduct and I'm not going to uh, talk on it because Dr. Davis is going to kind of go through this but many people, hopefully all parents have received the information either through the robocall or at, on the website. Uh, very important uh, uh, new code of conduct and want to thank the team for all the hard work, uh, Gary Beals and his leadership uh, on um, the decorum. 
and also wanted to just say that um, we had an opportunity, Connie and, and Dr. Graves and um, Courtney and I, to uh, go to um, Tantara uh, to be a part of the leadership summit for um, Missouri School Board Association, um, where Connie received her advanced certification in, in uh, <laughs> Also, the district got an award, and I, I think Dr. Gray is going to talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. No? Okay. <laughs> it, it's a governance award, and, and I do want to say this, that out of more than 500 some odd school districts, only 24 school, school districts received this award, and we were one of them. And, uh, and it really speaks volumes about the dedication of the board to um, uh, uh, to do more, to learn a little bit more about governance and, and working with the uh, school board. So congratulations to I just want to interject real quick. Donna failed to mention that she also received awards. She received the highest um, distinction that they currently have for MSBA, which is the Distinguished Award as board members. So congratulations, Donna. My portion of the strategic plan is uh, student achievement. What I felt to bring today was the graduation number. So by chance, do anyone have how many graduates we have for the month of May? So I can give you a guess about it. I'm yes, sorry, I was going to throw you on the I'm sorry. So I don't, these aren't accurate numbers, but I can tell you that um, MSB had about 110, uh, McClure had about 250, and I think that had North had over 360, if I'm not mistaken. So it was, it was quite a few. It was well over 600 for the district. Uh, but we're really excited about all of them graduating. All right. So um, that was one big thing I really wanted to make sure that we um, said that all of us had the opportunity to congratulate um, what, we, what we want to do and um, have products of um, our community so that graduate. And that's um, our goals every day to make sure that we graduate yeah. our students. So. Um, wanted to mention that summer school is well away. Uh, the session started, and we're doing session one at Johnson Wabash, Cross Keys, and McClure High School. Um, it will end June 16th, and then session two will begin June 19th. All state assessments have been completed. Research and evaluation is now pulling data for unofficial reports. Dr. Jadali's office will be compiling that data. Maryville had agreed to provide gifted certification to our teachers at $449 credit hour. They will meet on our campus and offer discounted rates, um, and this is for the Probe and STEAM school. And um, they will actually be wearing uniforms at that school, so those are being ordered. Um, and that's actually about it. Keep it short. <laughs> So good evening everyone. Um, hope that everybody is getting cool in this nice hot weather. I love it. Love the heat. So a couple of things and um, I won't be long either. Um, just to sort of piggyback on something Dr. Gray said about graduation. So for us it's just not about graduating, but it's graduating ready, um, quality and getting students prepared for whatever they decide they want to do. And for me, that looks like students being ready for college. If they don't want to go, that's their choice. But it is absolutely critical that we not only graduate them from high school, but with the courses and the knowledge and skills and dispositions that we know uh, make students successful in life. And I can tell you that when students, when our children graduate ready for college, whether they go or not, it improves our community. And I don't think there's a person who would disagree with that. And you know, we've been doing some really great things here in Berg, Floor, um, and we wanna keep doing those things. Uh, our Summer Institute just ended. Uh, we always partner with uh, Washington University and uh, we have a great partnership with them. And this summer, we were actually on the campus of UMSL also. Uh, they gave us some space to use over there as well. Uh, Dean uh, Dr. Taylor Ann Taylor who is the uh, Dean of the School of Education uh, uh, addressed us as well as Chancellor Wrighton over at, at Washington <laughs> University so we're just building those partnerships for North County so that we can make sure our children get the best 
education possible. Um, our leaders and lear our learners, one of the things I always say that while superintendent may be on my title, I'm a learner. We're all learners. And we have to make sure that we're building a learning organization, that adults are learning. And that's all of us, not just the folks who work for first floor, but if you are in this community, we need everybody to be a learner. Um, and reading is, to me, part and parcel, the order of our day. And here's one thing, if I had a dream, I'm not Martin Luther King, but <laughs> so. But if I had a dream that, uh, uh, and this is not too big, and, and, and I've, we've been entertaining some of our mayors and just talking about economic development, one of the things I would love to see happen in North County is that Barnes and Noble come back. Um, and that means that we have to be a reading community. And that, that just means students. I need parents reading, I need community people reading, I need reading to be the most important thing that we put in front of our children all the time, right? And this summer, we've been doing a lot of work around making sure that we are focusing on not just the billion word challenge that we met last year, but our children are continuing to read throughout the summer. Uh, reading books they enjoy, reading books on the Lexile level so they grow, um, and then taking AR tests. We have schools open, we're feeding lunch and breakfast, we have our libraries open, uh, so students can come in and take those AR tests, and uh, we are holding children accountable. It's just not reaching a goal, it's lifelong learning. And so what I need from you all and the community is to make reading a priority. And, uh, you know, all of us need to be reading. I'm going to be having a book club, um, and, you know, I love to talk, right? Um, we're going to have a book club and that we're going to invite our community to come and be a part of our fireside chats, uh, coffee and, uh, you know, crumb cakes, milk and cookies, whatever you want to call it. I just want people reading. And, and, and I'm going to tell you that whether the kids are black or white, the matter, what matters is if children are reading all the time and they're growing, we don't have to worry about scores, right? Like they will improve if children are really going deep around that. So I just got to say that all the time so that we keep that in front of us. Um, we've already mentioned a couple of dates that I think are important, and I'll just underscore them again and really encourage uh, all of us to put these on your calendars. Um, so um, the 28th, uh, we're going to have an all administrators meeting. This is really for them. Uh, and we're going to be specifically talking about, uh, I call it the SEC, for those of you who are from the South, I'm you know, North Carolinian. Um, and though we're the, you know, the ACC, uh, the SEC is the Southeastern Conference. The SEC Southeastern Conference Student Expectations Code, right? <laughs> so yeah, I try to make those connections, right? So there is a shift in uh, how we're going to be holding our students accountable at school. Um, and the, um, so Gary and his leadership with the team there has been focusing specifically on how we look at discipline. What I can tell you is that if you take a look at the new code of conduct, the new student expectations code, it pushes suspensions down further so that it takes a while for a child to even get to that place where they get suspended. Does that mean they can't get suspended? It just means that we want to put some other practices in place to uh, you know, mitigate students' uh, the behaviors so that they don't get to that place. Restorative justice and other kinds of practices. Uh, trauma-informed schools and PBIS and I'm going to be at some training uh, at KU in a, about a week and a half uh, for two days on CI3T and some of that is what uh, Gary has been leading uh, as well as Dr. Hazel around comprehensive in, uh, integrated three-tier support. So thinking about not just the behavioral and the academic needs of our children but also those social and emotional needs that are there that we have to respond to, right? Uh, so that new stu student expectations code, if you have not read it, please put your uh, mind around what that means in uh, elementary school, a student can have up to 10 opportunities before they get to 10 days in a hearing. And eight opportunities in secondary schools, and secondary schools for the purposes of this, right now will be seventh through 12th grade, okay? We only have one uh, middle school that has six graders right now, so we're gonna treat all six graders the same. Um, so if you're in grades K through six, uh, the new code says that you can have 10 referrals, and this is, after we've gone through all those classroom um, structures, these are only responses to referrals. Uh, once a student gets a referral, they can get up to 10 before they could either be taken out of school or put in the alternative program. And we, uh, again, I always try to think about how we can uh, get them before they get to that place. And then in high school um, is uh, eight times, or uh, secondary, so seventh grade through 12th grade, uh, eight opportunities. The, one of the things that we want to be clear about, and I've said this throughout, especially when uh, January 1st came and the law changed, if you will, and there were some you know, shifts in uh, how we interpreted uh, you know, a couple of uh, uh, some of the language in the law. 
So the one thing that I've always said is that we want behavior to improve, okay? And, and I'm gonna be consistent on that. We want behavior to improve. Referrals, if they go down, great, but I want students to make better choices so that when they're in school, I don't need, you know, students cussing teachers out and I don't need teachers cussing students out. I need people <laughs> thinking about how we behave, how we conduct ourselves so that students can learn, right? Like that is the most important thing we can do is make sure they get a great education, not just the high school diploma, but they know some good knowledge by the time they are done. Uh, so please take a look at that. We do have the dress code um, that uh, was also part of that at the STEAM school. We've communicated that to parents. Um, and so um, I'm excited about that. You know, I, I love uniforms, but you know, certainly people have their um, opinions about that, but we will have uniforms at our, uh, at our STEAM school. So please take a look at the student expectation code um, and uh, let me know or any of us know if there are any questions uh, about that. The fourth is our ribbon cutting ceremony at 10.30 a.m. in the morning. We have a list of people we've invited. We invite, I formally invite you right now. So if you don't get a formal invitation, Joe Davis is formally inviting everybody that's sitting in here right now to our ribbon cutting ceremony at our new STEAM school, uh, which is on Dunn Road on Friday, August 4th at 10.30 a.m. It is gonna be amazing, absolutely amazing. The school, I was there the other day and uh, I just want to give Terry and Laura another hand if you would join me in that. <laughs> they have done a yeoman's job at making sure that uh, the contractors and everybody who's involved are following uh, the timeline and getting things done, and it is a transformation. If you had seen it before and see it now, and it's not even in its finishing stage, uh, final stages yet. But we will open in August. Uh, so we are excited about that. August 5th is back to school, please come. That morning here on these grounds, uh, we're gonna have lots of food and fun, and yes, I'm gonna get in a ducking booth. Um, and <laughs> I can swim though, right? <laughs> August uh, 2nd, just to jump back a bit, is our convocation date when all of our teachers come back and then school opens uh, for us on August 9th. That's the first day of school for students. Um, and that's also a board meeting night, and it's also our summer, our summer graduation. So please keep those dates in mind. Finally, um, there are a couple of other policies we're working on, and I say this intentionally. So just like the student expectation code policy uh, that we put out and then we gave opportunities for after the first reading for public comment. Whenever we change policy, typically the process is we do a first reading and we look for comments from the community and then we take those comments into consideration and if it's not significant, we go for second reading uh, and ask for approval. Uh, if there is, then we would uh, look at that and see what's the best way forward. There are a couple of other policies we're working on. And my hope is that we can get some of these in place before school opens. And I'm gonna just give you a, just, just a sprinkle of what they are, right? First one is the admissions, um, the attendance policy rather, the attendance policy. Um, we are held accountable from DESE. In fact, our funding hinges on attendance. I need students in school. And I need that policy holding students and parents and us accountable to making sure they're here. I need students in school 90% of the time, 90, 90, 90. I don't need them coming to school late and leaving early. I want them here. In fact, in fact I want them here every day. So our attendance policy will shift so that um, it holds students accountable. And then the second policy is the promotion uh, standards. And I think, and this will be in the first um, draft of that language, that I think attendance uh, should go with promotion and promotion should be hinged on uh, a couple of things, but especially grades and attendance, right? So all those things will go together. So if a student is promoted to the next grade, then there are gonna be some responsibilities there to get there, right? So the promotion policy and the attendance policy are those two that we're working on diligently. When they go out for virtual reading, please look at it, read it, um, offer comments, and uh, give us an opportunity to hear what they are, because I want everybody's voice to be heard. Um, and while we may not agree on everything, uh, we will defend your opportunity to, to say it. Uh, so please look for that. <coughs> Sorry. Dr. Dr. The board allocates this portion of the meeting to allow stakeholders the opportunity to comment on board on both agenda items and non-agenda items at the start of each board meeting. Prior to the public comment period, participants are asked to fill out a, the, out a comment card with their name, address, phone number, email, address, and topic to be addressed and will be allowed up to three minutes to speak. 
Members of the audience who wish to speak to the board are requested to speak from the podium, identify themselves in keeping with district policies 4054, 4059, and personnel law should refrain from making negative comments that are personal, personally identifiable. While the board will not directly respond to speakers during the public comment period, the board president may make clarifying remarks at the end of the comment session to correct any misstatement or facts, or the vice president will. Are, are there any cards? Oh. No, I didn't make out a card because I didn't know I was going to talk. And I didn't know there was two board members that weren't going to be here. I'm disappointed that uh, those members aren't here tonight. Nobody else has to have a card. He needs a card. I'll make a card out. Thank you. Everybody knows me in this room. While Mr. Clark is doing that, is there any other cards that need to come up from? It's okay if I make this card out at my chair and I'll give it to somebody after. This is fine. Okay. okay. Mr. Clark, you can speak. Mr. Mr. Clark, you can go speak. I made my comment. I said I'm disappointed. That <coughs> Two board members are here tonight. Okay, thank you. <laughs> the administration presents the following items for approval under the consent agenda. Madam Secretary, can you please read the disbursements? Payroll, teacher, non teacher. $8,658,487.99. Operational disbursements, $2,000. $880,378.22 with a total of $11,538,866.21. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. It's been motioned by Ms. Hogshead and seconded by Connie, um, sorry, Ms. Harch to approve um, the agenda. Um, no, 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 no. Oh, all in favor, I'm sorry. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? So I have it. Now we will have um, Mr. Bowling. Good evening, board. Uh, the Urban Land Institute is the oldest and largest network across disciplinary real estate and land use experts in the world. <coughs> Their mission is to provide leadership and the responsible use of land and in, in creating sustaining thriving communities worldwide. Urban Plan, the supplementary curriculum, will be utilized by our FBLA and DECA clubs after the students have competed in their club competitions in February and March. This 15-hour cross-curricular project-based material will be utilized in the business technology class in McLaurin North in the second quarter. There will be teacher training in July at no cost to the district. It's a two-day training. I believe they're going to fly the teachers down to uh, Atlanta. So there might be a conflict with one of the teachers. Um, so they might have to go to the training <coughs> in December. Uh, this will be utilized at all three high schools. And um, it's either going to be in uh, the business technology classes. And McClure is going to be utilized in the DECA. Uh, club after, after the competitions in uh, February. Can I have a motion? I move that we accept the Urban Land Institute. Second. It's been uh, motion by Ms. Hogshead and seconded by Dr. Thurman. Discussion? Uh, can I just make one comment? Um, just one quick comment. We had this conversation in cabinet and in other venues too about uh, the Urban Land Institute Supplemental <coughs> Curriculum. And we've been um, working uh, really diligently on project-based learning. Um, and I think this is important, uh, this particular initiative, because um, students will learn more about um, land in our area, uh, real estate, commercial and residential, 
uh, and also about uh, how that fits into the governance structure of a community. I think it's really important uh, because our children need to be more educated, and you get some of this in civics, but our children and our community need to be more educated about the, not just the process, but also about um, finance and about um, how that works into the grand scheme of things. In particular, and we've been working with the Federal Reserve some on this as well, um, and our AP economics class will address some of these things. But uh, you know, one of the, the biggest issues in most communities, if you talk about improving, is economics. And a lot of it comes from education, right? Um, budgeting and credit and finance and making sure our communities are educated on how that process works. And one of the things I believe this will do is to help us along those lines. So I just wanted to say that along the lines of uh, project-based learning, giving children opportunities to look at a project and learn all those skills in the process. And it certainly is uh, aligned with the standards. Any more discussion? All in favor of the recommendation of the to adopt the Urban Land Institute supplemental curriculum for three high schools, please say uh, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Dr. P. Walker, discuss federal programs. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I am discussing a policy, the Federal Programs and Projects Cash Management Policy. It was recommended by MSBA to be in compliance with DESE auditor requests. Basically, DESE's Financial Management Office is requiring that all Missouri school districts request payments on a reimbursement basis only. Currently in the school district, we already do that. Once we spend, then we request the payment. And so DESE just basically wants that to be the, the, the process. The federal government actually has a little more lenient um, process, and so just does he will be a little stricter in that the feds say that you can have a, um, you can request payment as long as you're going to spend those dollars within three days. So if you look at the actual policy recommendation, it only strikes out a line that states that, um, that we would do that within three days. So we're basically bringing to you this evening this policy DJFA, uh, yes, DJFA. And if you have any questions, I would hope that I'd be able to answer them for you. Can I have a motion? Oh, first, I'm sorry. Well, a discussion? Question? All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hampton? Good evening, board. Good evening. For the past few years, the district has used the school messenger notification system. The notification system is a primary method of communication from the district to families and staff. Uh, a lot of people call it a robocall or dialer or things like that. Um, but in the interest of providing additional uh, opportunities for interaction and communication with our stakeholders, um, we uh, uh, posted a request for proposals that would include the addition of a fully custom mobile app that will provide additional cutting edge points of contact with the stakeholders. Uh, the InTouch notification system will replace our current school messenger notification system at a savings of almost $7,500 um, and includes the addition of the mobile app uh, along with several other features, uh, notification about attendance, grades, things like that. The administration recommends the board approve a one-year contract with EduLink Systems for their in-touch notification system and mobile app in the amount of $11,000. Can I have a motion? I move we approve. Um, been motioned by Ms. Hogshead, second by Ms. Harge. Discussion? Hearing none. Um, all those in favor say aye. All right. Aye. All opposed, nay. Motion carried. Thank you. Ms. Madrusi. Good evening, board, Dr. Davis, and the public. Administration is seeking a resolution authorizing the issuance of. Oh, sorry, you're next. <laughs> sorry, I got a lot of agenda items. Sorry. Um, authorizing the issuance of nine point three million dollars of principal um, um, amount of the general obligation bond series two thousand seventeen through our Missouri direct deposit. Could I have Jason and Joe and Lorenzo come up, please? 
Um, today we, um, we, I shouldn't say, I, I just was on the phone. Lorenzo is from Steeple. He's the manager, managing director who I work with at Steeple who did all the pricing. And um, Jason and Jason Terry and Joe Pal Palombo is, are from Gilmore and Bell. They're our bond attorneys. And so they help with this whole process. Um, so I'm bringing them up if you guys have any questions. But administration is seeking um, a your authorization to go ahead and sell these bonds. And I'm going to turn it over to um, Lorenzo just to kind of explain the process a little bit. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks, Laura. I only need uh, a little bit of your time, only about 45 minutes or so, um, but I'll run through the entire scenario. Um, I'm really excited about this one. Today, we sold nine, a, little, uh, a little over $9.3 million of general obligation bonds for the school districts. Uh, we'll close that transaction on June 27th. Um, what I was most pleased about, we had a, a host of new buyers that kind of uh, came into the marketplace today that purchased some of the district's bonds. Uh, they include, um, which is new, uh, which I kind of looked up some of the historical buyers of some of the district's bonds. I always forget how to, uh, how to pronounce this, Bussy Bank, uh, Landmark Bank, Performance Trust, and IFS Securities. So those were new, uh, four new buyers that came to the marketplace today to purchase some of the school district's bonds. So we we're pleased, to that, pleased with that. Uh, we had a host of other uh, purchasers that had been in the marketplace before and purchased some of the district's bonds. Um, so there was the re regular cast of characters. And through this process, we did uh, do a double A plus under a double A plus rating because we enrolled the bonds in the direct deposit program. Uh, and the district did, did receive an A plus underlying <laughs> rating uh, based on the underlying credit strength of the school district. So we affirmed uh, that rating. Uh, that rating, I think there are a little over 500 school districts in the state of Missouri. Um, I think only 181 are rated by S&P. That A plus is within 25 percent, the top 25 percent of all school districts that are rated by uh, S&P. So we're very pleased with that outcome. And I think on June 27th, we'll be prepared to Stiefel, not myself, but Stiefel uh, will wire uh, $9.8 million to the district. And from that point on, you'll have money to spend. <coughs> and I'll open it up to any questions. Oh, and the overall interest rate was 3.49%. I almost forgot the most important thing, yes. but on a 20 year financing. Can so I'll open it up to any questions. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Hawk, Ms. Hawkins, second by Dr. Thurman. Discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Yes. <laughs> All in favor? Uh -huh. All in favor? Uh -huh. All in favor? Uh -huh. All right. All opposed? So moved. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Madrusic again. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> On July 29th, um, USDA Food and Nutrition Services finalized regulations for a new, for new written wellness guidelines. Um, these guidelines are um, really important for us because we receive a lot of federal guide, uh, federal funds um, for our food. And so we have to comply with the federal requirements on, and have to have this um, new wellness policy in place by June 30th of 2017. So this was a policy that we took to negotiations and during negotiations um, we, did, we signed an agreement to develop the committee of classroom teachers, teachers, an NEA rep, our dietitian, and our wellness coordinators to provide the required to review the required components of the policy and to craft a policy of the wellness procedure manual to comply with the USDA requirement. Good evening, board. Good evening. Um, on February 24th, we went with teachers and administrators, like you've heard, to update our current wellness policy um, to meet state and federal guidelines. Um, the policy language has been changed to include activity time. Uh, nutrition promotion, uh, a overview process for the committee, and standards for food and beverages that are provided to our students throughout the school, school day. Um, these updates will put us in compliance with USDA and federal guidelines. And to help the schools uh, better transition in this new or updated policy, we're developing frameworks to help support those schools through this process. Um, as this wellness committee is ever growing, next year we are going to continue our meetings that involve stakeholders from schools, buildings, administration and community to move forward to help support our students to make healthy choices. Do you have any questions for us? Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. The motion by Ms. Hoffett, second by Ms. Harge. Discussion? 
Hearing those, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, Ms. Madruzic, a food service management company. The district recently solicited bids for the management of its food service operations. Bids were due on May 10, 2017. Since then, a selection committee conducted site visits, reviewed and evaluated bids, interviewed pers prospective companies, and developed a recommendation report. Administration will re present a recommendation for the Board of Education approval on June 14, 2017. Um, I move to rescind our motion with regards to the uh, Ferguson Forest School District Food Service Management Company made at the May 24, 2017 meeting. Okay. It's been motioned by Ms. Hogsett, second by Mr. Eaglin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Can I have a new motion? I would uh, like to move to accept SFE as a food service management company for Ferguson Florissant School District during the 2017-2018 school year. Second. It's been motioned by Ms. Hogshead, second by Mr. Eager. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Ms. Madruz again. Missouri statutes require districts to approve a budget at the beginning of the school year and as you all as I continue to say every time I stand up here and talk about a budget a budget is a very moving document so it changes the day that I, it changed today actually so it is the minute it, the ink touches the paper it changes um, the board approved the original budget in June of 2016 since then um, we've had some things happen and um, not things happen but we've added some expenditures to the budget that will make it exceed the original budget allocation and so we are going requesting the board to adopt a revised budget in order to recruit to increase the budget allocations to cover these expenditures um, right now in our operating funds we are balanced but we still have half a month to go and I just need to do this to make sure that we cover in case we have um, energy costs and things like that that we have to pay bills for so I wanted to increase the general fund by 1.35 million dollars um, I also need to we bought with the capital bond um, or the capital fund we bought a building in the middle of the year and so I need to increase the capital fund by 3.8 million dollars and also debt service we sold some bonds earlier this year and so I need to increase my debt service by two hundred and fifty thousand dollars Motion by Ms. Hawkins, second by Ms. Harge. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? All right. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Ms. Madrus, one more time? This is my last one, I promise. <laughs> um, I have a presentation. <laughs> So it is required by law that we adopt, adopt a budget before July 1st of every year. And so I'm here for the budget adoption. Um, typically, in years past, we've always brought the capital and bond budgets to you earlier in the year so that uh, facilities could get a head start on their, on their project. However, this year our project is a STEAM school. So we just went ahead and brought both the operating bond and the capital budgets together in this, in this budget. Um, in our budget, it contains both re budgets of revenue and expenditures, and so I'm going to kind of go over a little bit of these um, for both what our assumptions are for the 17-18 um, school year. The district receives 53% of its revenue from local dollars, which means tax, the tax we set a tax rate and um, we receive money from property taxes. Um, this year was a reassessment year, and the assessments um, came in really well, but these um, assessment numbers are preliminary right now. We will not receive our final assessment numbers until July, and that's when we set our tax rate. So the numbers looked really well, looked really good. Um, our assessments were up 7.3%. 
However, you know, there's going to be some people are protesting now and they're doing some things, not protesting, but protesting their taxes now. And so that number can change, but that's what I base the budget. Well, I actually base the budget increase on 2.1% because there's a Hancock amendment that says that we can only increase the budget by 2.1%. Um, this will result in an increase of $2 million in revenue for the budget. The net was using a 95% collection rate. So we should see an increase in our local revenue for that. Also, good news is the economy is better and sales taxes come or sales sales taxes um, up this year. So 2.22 percent for the state from the prior year. Um, our our the sales the local sales that you guys have here go to the state and then they distribute that on the weighted average daily attendance. And so, but I do this because of the increase of the sales revenue. I do believe that we will see an increase in the funds for next year as there as well. County assumptions, 1.8% um, of our revenues come from county, and um, our state, util state assessed utility revenue can came in higher than it has in the previous years, and so um, I did increase the budget for about 100000 for next year in the state assessed utilities. And then the district receives about 30% of revenue from the state, and so um, you heard earlier that the state is fully funding their formula, so I, um, even with that fully funding, they, they play numbers with it, so they decreased one of the factors that they used so that everybody could have full funding. So um, I do expect that we'll see about a $1.8 million decline of, of revenue because of that. Um, however, we did receive more revenue this year at the end of the year because of, of the way that the money was coming in, but again, he said they're going to, and the state's real good about holding your with holding your state money until the end to make sure that they don't have to take money back away from you at the end of the year. So, I did um, I did put a 1.8 million de decrease of revenue under the state formula. Um, also, I think that the transportation will remain flat at 400,000 as it was this year. And special ed early ed is also a large amount of money that we receive in state funding, and that always remains flat. So whatever they spend we receive back as reimbursements. And so I just met, kept that as flat. Federal funds are, are typically about 9% of the revenue that come to the district. We do participate in the community eligibility program where all of our students eat free. So that is a large source of revenue that we receive every year. Um, I didn't increase it for next year. Um, although we did, um, we did increase our factor for the CEP. So we might see a little bit, but I just kept it flat for right now. And overall, the federal revenue is budgeted to increase by 230000 because we were awarded the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Grant. Our rev other revenue, local revenue is anticipated to drop significantly, significantly because Riverview Gardens has attained full accreditation, and so we should see a loss of about $325,000 um, from Riverview. For the expenditures, um, negotiations, went very well this year and they resulted in a step increase for all our, our, our employee groups and that average was about 2.64 percent. So this increase of expenditures in the budget was about 1.7 million dollars. But the good news is that we've really been having some good experience in our insurance. Um, our, our employees have not been as, we've had some really good luck with people not being really very ill right now and so um, that that has brought the insurance rates down and so we did not have to raise our insurance costs for next year and that saves a significant amount of money which is really great and it also saves money for the employees too if they have um, you know dependent insurance that they pay for they will not see an increase in their um, costs this year in the budget for expenditures I did add some two new, our two new ELA humanities coordinator positions um, there were two marketing specialists that we didn't have last year, and so those were added for increased communication support for the three areas that we have. Also, we added some costs for some of our new programming, the IB, the AP, and the early college programs. So I added some costs for the instructional materials that we're going to need for those programs and for the tuition for the early college. Instructional materials were added for startup materials for the STEAM Academy. Um, but some of the savings that we received were um, $460,000 of turnover sa savings for our certified staff. Um, you know, whenever they retire at a high cost and we bring in the teachers at a lower cost, we see a savings, and that was about $460,000 this year. And also, um, we uh, are continuing to look at all of our positions as they open up throughout the year, especially more throughout the year with our operations to just see if we can see and seek additional savings throughout the year. So looking at our revenue, 
this is really hard to see. I apologize. This the screen's not real good, but um, we, like I said, receive most of our money from local revenue. Um, about seventy-four point three million dollars is what we will receive in local revenue. Forty-two point nine million dollars will come in from the, from the state. About um, twelve million will come in from federal. Ten million from other, and then that ten million other is the money that we'll receive from a bond that I'm going to sell later on next year. And then one point eight is going to come, million is going to come in from the county. And that we have to break that revenue out when it comes in into the different funds. So we have a general fund that pays for all of our operating expenditures. The special fund pays for the teacher salaries. The capital and bond can only be spent on our infrastructure type and technology expenses. And then debt service is used to pay for our bonds that we've already sold. So um, 78.7 million is going to go to the special to pay the teachers. 49.6 goes to the general fund for the regular operating funds. 9.8 million dollars will go into the capital or the bond fund, and then 2.9 will go into debt service. Then also, oops, then we're going to talk about the expenditures and how they're broken out. And again, I apologize, this is the screen, it's really hard and dark to see. But you can see that big slice of the pie on the right hand side, that's 58, that represents 53% of the expenditures that we spend on instruction. So 53% of our of our expenditures go to the classroom there. that's going to instruction. 9% um, goes to the student services, which are your nurses, your guidance counselors, the people that support the kids and the, and the students in the schools. 3% goes to the improvement of instruction, so the professional development. 3% of our of our budget goes to that. 12% um, goes to administrative cost. 12% goes to facilities and security. 2% goes to early ed, and 1% goes to a community engagement. So as you can see, there's a breakdown here of like actual, actual, what I believe is gonna, and I, this, this is the worst case scenario with estimated, because I, I just said if we were going to spend all the funds that we had, this is what it would look like, and then budget. So for next year, we're going to um, spend about $67.3 million on instruction, 11.7 on student services, 3.8 on instructional support, 9.4 on, on building administration, 6 million on general administration, 15.4 million on the operation of plant and security, um, 3.6 on transportation, <coughs> 6 million on food service, 3.3 3 million on early ed, and about 1.4 million on community services. So for a total expenditure of $127.8 million in our operating funds. <coughs> And with that, with that, we also break out our um, funds by object, which, which means what are, you know, where are those funds going? Um, so 47% of the funds go to the certified staff, 18% of our funds go to non-certified staff, and those are both salaries, and then 21% goes to benefits. So 86% of our budget goes towards salary and benefits. So that's a large portion of our budget that is taken for the, um, those costs. 8% is going to purchase service and 6% is going to materials. And I also explained that we were going to um, have you approve the bond and capital budget. <coughs> and I broke that out into two pieces this year because we've got the bond funds, but we also have some certificates of participation funds, funds and those will be paid out of the capital account and then the bond, will, bond expenditures will come out of the bond account. So we will do um, equipment and capital replacement. We will buy some buses again this year. Um, there will be some infrastructure and building system things that need to be done, and that's things like HVAC and um, roofs and things like that. The schools get $100,000. Um, major replacement outlay is $900,000. Technology services is going to get a million. And the STEAM Academy construction is $7.4 million for a total bond budget of $10.5 million. And then with our capital funds, which is the certificate of participation money, we're going to buy STEAM Academy furniture, some title that'll help pay for, well, the Title I equipment will be paid for with the Title I funds, but I put it under the capital fund. And the Carl Perkins equipment will also be reimbursed. And then um, insurance replacement is always, whenever something breaks, we take it out of the capital fund. And then we're paying for the STEAM Academy kitchen equipment out of the capital budget as well. Then we're also putting on the new academy, the STEAM Academy roof will come. It won't really be paid until next year, so until like in July. So I put it in to next year. And then the Academy building improvements are about $1.1 .1 million. Um, we need it to make a payment for our secure certificates of deposit for the lease payment for a total capital budget of $2.1 million. 
And so for a summary, our operating revenue is going to be about $128.3 million. Our operating expenditures are going to be $127.8 million for an operating balance of 16.38%. This number is low because I had the expenditures. I'm sure this is going to be a lot higher, but at this point in time, if we were to spend all the money that we that I thought we were going to do in this month at 1.3, it'll take that fund balance down to 16.38, but I do believe that's going to come in higher when all the revenue and expenditures come in. So as you can see, in 13-14, our fund balances were 14.71. They popped up to 17.57, dropped down to 17.35. This year, if we spend that $1.3 million in June, it'll be 16.10, and then it'll pop back up again because of our, um, we'll have bring in about $400,000 more in revenue than expenditures at 16.38%. And I can say that we are really going to be focusing on um, doing a lot more um, budget cut type things in this next year. Um, there is going to be a lot of discussions coming along, which will help bring our fund balances back up. So we do anticipate a budget, a balanced budget at the end of June of 2018. Um, we are continuing, like I said, to review all of our revenues and expenditures throughout the year, and we will continue to evaluate all of our expenditures to make sure that we have adequate resources to put into our classrooms. So the administration is asking the board to approve the 1718 operating and capital bond budget. May I have a motion? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we did at the beginning and then she gave her presentation. You asked for the motion right after you stated it. No, that was for no, that was for the that was for the that was for the oh uh, um the twenty seven the bond the yeah. no. Okay, I move again. Move on. Yeah. Um Leslie um Motion and Ms. Hawk said, I'm sorry, um, Harsh. Harsh. Second. Exactly. Um, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Oh, any discussion? She's confused me. I know. Okay. What okay. discussion? And I might have missed it. I was trying to keep up with what are reserves? Like. So right, so if we spend everything that we're going to, that I think, I don't think we're going to spend everything in June that I just had you approve from the other budget. It'll go down to, it'll go down to 16.3, but it'll go back up to 16.38 for next year, at the end of next year. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't sure if that's what, from 17. I think you called it something else though. Um, it's the, called the fund balance. Fund balance, okay. Just want to make sure I was reading that correct. Right. So 16. Right. And that's a little less than it, last year. It is a little less. We were at 17. I right, think. it's 17, yes. yes. Okay. I'm expecting it to come in higher, though, at the end of the year, but I just, I, you know, I always yeah, do the worst case scenario. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very thorough report. Mm -hmm. Any more discussion? <laughs> All in favor of administration recommending the Board of Double District Operating Budget for fiscal 2017-2018. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you very you much. So much. At the April 26, 2017 reorganization meeting, the Board of Education elected two delegates and one alternate to the Missouri School Board Association Delegates Assembly. MSBA regulation states that MSBA delegates shall have at least one year of school board service. Ms. Ponder was elected as one of the delegates and because Ms. Ponder is in her first year as a board member, the board is asked to replace Ms. Ponder as a delegate. The other delegates to the MSBA delegates assembly is Ms. Connie Harge and the alternate is Dr. Paulette Thurman. Are there any nominations for MSBA delegates? I know. I know. Dr. Dr. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Second. Okay. Double D. I'm double right. Um, all in favor? Aye. All right. Do we get to discuss? Any discussion? All right. Um, the board the board may suspend policy 4051 requirement that all regular meetings will be held on the second Wednesday of the month at 7 p.m. to transact. Oh. Transact the uh, business of the district and to consider items of policy pertaining to the district. Because the superintendent of schools, Dr. Joseph Davis, will be attending the Pelp Institute at Harvard University the week of July 9, 2017. 
It is a recommendation that the July 12, 2017 board meeting be moved to July 19, 2017. May I have a recommendation? So I move. Second. Uh, it's been moved by Dr. Thurman, second by Ms. Hogshead. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? All right. All opposed? Motion carries. If no further business, adjourn the meeting or uh, we just get through. Oh. <laughs> 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 <laughs>